This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 81 was recorded September 21st, 2017. I'm Eric Townsend. Hilltop Securities Chief Strategist Mark Grant will be joining me as this week's featured interview guest. Mark and I will discuss this week's FOMC announcement, why Mark thinks the U.S. dollar has undergone a secular trend change, Mark's outlook for stock markets around the globe, treasury yields, precious metals, the looming pensions crisis, and a whole lot more. Be sure to stay tuned, though, for our post-game segment after the feature interview when retired hedge fund manager Jesse Felder will be joining us to discuss the lofty valuations in equity markets and to give us an update on the equity indicators that he follows. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Now, Eric, the S&P 500 certainly has started to stall out here as the Fed announcement came out uh, on uh, Wednesday. Uh, What's your feeling here on the S&P 500? Well, a lot of technicians are starting to call 2526, 2526 is a short-term upside target that they see. Whether or not we get there, you know, remains to be seen. I feel, though, Patrick, like I always say the same thing for the last several shows about equities, which is I think these valuations are crazy high, but at the same time, I don't see any reason to think that this trend is ending. Now, frankly, I don't follow equity uh, markets as closely as I follow commodities, particularly crude oil. So what I'm going to do is is ask our friend Jesse Felder to join us in our post-game segment. He does a lot of work following a number of indices to mark indicators and so forth. I want to get an update from Jesse on whether he's seeing any technical signs that this thing is really about to roll over, or if we're just going to continue to march higher, as has been the case. So stay tuned for that after our feature interview with Mark Grant. Now let's move on to that U.S. dollar index, and it really looks like the U.S. dollar is finding some sort of supports here. We haven't really seen any big breakout just yet, but certainly some support in there. What's your feeling? What's next for the dollar? Well, to be sure, Patrick, this has got to be the biggest question in finance right now. Is this U.S. dollar secular bull market set to resume the way Ralph Paul and Julian Brigden have told us to expect, or are we in a secular bear market? Has the trend reversed, as Luke Groman told us a couple of weeks ago? I'm definitely going to be asking Mark Grant that question in today's feature interview. Seems like we're bouncing right now. A hawkish FOMC meeting certainly helped with that. Uh, I think the FOMC MC's announcement to begin quantitative tightening is really insignificant because it was so widely anticipated that it was fully priced in. Definitely, though, the important question to figure out, probably the single most important question in finance right now is, is this a secular change of direction or are we going to see a resumption of the dollar bull market? Jury's out in my mind. I had previously been pretty convinced of the bullish argument. The more that I see of really smart people that we've talked to in recent weeks uh, coming around more experts that have a bearish view, it's really opened my eyes. And you know, the first guy that really gave us a secular bearish view in this program was our friend Mark Yusko. We ought to get him back on the program so we can get an update on his outlook. He certainly is the guy that has called it most accurately and earliest in terms of our past guests. I'm undecided, though, at this point, and I'm very much looking forward to having more experts that are dollar bearish on the program. Now, Eric, let's move on to crude oil Crude oil uh, seems to be surging higher in spite of all of these data points coming out. It's holding up around this $50 range. What's your thinking of the next step for crude oil prices? Well, as I mentioned last week, we definitely saw a breakout from the downsloping channel that was in play. So, you know, that's a cup and handle formation that targets maybe as high as 52 or 53. We're hitting major resistance right now, right around $51. Now, it's fascinating, this 51 spot 08 is getting a lot of coverage from some major analysts who are saying because that's the 200-day moving average, that that's the reason that we're seeing major resistance here. Now, that is, in fact, the 200-day moving average, Patrick, on the single contract chart. In other words, on the November 2017 delivery contract only. 
If you remember when we had Jack Schwager, the man who literally wrote the book on futures trading on the program several months ago, he went out of his way to comment. I think he even used the word incompetence to describe professional traders who don't understand that moving averages are relevant, at least according to Jack Schwager, on a nearest futures chart. Because if you plot it on a single contract chart, you're looking at a 200-day moving average of prices that were way away. There was so much contango in the market six months ago that those those prices were way away from the front month price. So in order to get an average of front month prices, you need to look at a nearest futures chart. Now, Jack may be the man who wrote the book on futures trading, but it seems like a lot of really well-respected professional oil traders use that single chart number. So is the 200-day moving average 49 spot 60, which is what I have plotted on my chart, the way Jack Schwager tells us in his books, to do it? Or is 51 spot 08 the 200 day moving average according to the way it plots on a single month contract chart. I would say that I'm right, but it seems like the market is paying attention to 5108 right now. So watch for that level. I think that probably what's holding us up here, because I have been expecting this market to roll back over, is the OPEC meeting, which is Friday. So we're recording this, of course, on Thursday afternoon. I don't know the outcome. I wouldn't be surprised if one of two things happens. Either there's no significant news or announcement out of that meeting, and the market turns south from here. I think there's some hope in the system, people expecting that maybe some thing is going to happen at the OPEC meeting. No reason to expect that. They've told us that there's not going to be any announcement at this meeting. Uh, Or maybe there is some kind of propaganda that is slung after the meeting, and that pushes a false breakout up above that 5108 resistance, maybe as high as 52 for a few days, and then it rolls over. Of course, I could be wrong. Maybe we're headed back to 55, but uh, I'm waiting for this market to roll over. I think that as we start to get back to meaningful inventory numbers, which right now we still have a lot of noise in the system from the hurricanes, I think that you are going to see a trend of builds in inventory and that sentiment is going to change. From a seasonality standpoint, right around the middle of September is when we start to have a seasonal trend downward in prices. As far as inventory this week, crude oil building 4.6 million barrels, about in line with expectations, a little bit higher. Cushing, Oklahoma, 703,000 barrel build, gasoline drawing down 2.1 million barrels, and distillates drawing down a massive, massive 5.7 million barrels. Now, I talked to our friend Sam Madani, the founder of TankerTrackers.com. They had projected a 12.8 million barrel build this week, and the reason for that is they are aware of about 5 million barrels of unaccounted for oil. In other words, in all of the confusion after Hurricane Harvey, there were about 5 million barrels barrels worth of customs receipts for oil that had come into the country and didn't get counted in last week's number. So they thought it would be counted in this week's number. Sam was able to reach out to EIA after the number came out and said, hey, what what happened here? And they explained to him, no, that's not the procedure. They don't add forgotten oil into the next week's number. What they do is they just sit on it. And at the end of the month, they issue an adjustment, but it doesn't get reported. So we think there is actually 5 million barrels of unaccounted for oil that got forgotten about in the uh, aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. And it sounds like it will never show up in a weekly build or draw number. It's just going to be adjusted out in the month end EIA report. So it probably won't affect prices. So just to summarize, my view on crude oil is I do think that we're at very lofty prices here. I think that we're overdue for a turn back to the downside. But we need to get through OPEC and we need to get some unclouded data into the system before that may happen. So could take another week or two. I am expecting a reversal to the downside. Now let's move on to gold. And it really looks like the moment that dollar index put in that short term low, the gold has really started to correct here. What's your feeling about where gold is going next? Well, you know, Patrick, I mentioned last week that I might buy gold at 1300 and as I watched it, I decided not to, and a big reason is I definitely think that a bounce in the dollar index has begun. Is the dollar index in a secular trend reversal? As I said earlier, I don't know, but 
there's at least a bounce in play. Now, if we are going to see a resumption of a secular bull market in the dollar, gold is going to tank here. So I passed on 1300 I may try a small position at 1281 which is the next repair area lower. But, you know, I'm going to have a tight stop on that because if the dollar index bounces meaningfully, I think that we could see much lower gold prices. On the other hand, if Luke Groman is proven correct and we really are seeing a secular trend reversal, then then that's a whole other story, and this is probably going to be a bargain opportunity at 1281. I think we are going to see that price, so I'm still watching it. As we're talking on Thursday afternoon, we're just flirting with the 50-day moving average, which is around 1291 or so. Now, Eric, let's move on to those 10-year Treasury yields. What's your feeling about the next wave of interest rate trends? Well, we're back at two spot 27 as we're recording this around the close on Thursday afternoon. Not a big change from last week, right in the middle of that trading range between two spot 12 and two spot 50 or so. So, you know, which way is this going to resolve? I, I don't really have a short term view. I do think ultimately that we're going to get back to lower interest rates, lower yields. 212 was the critical number. We thought we took it out. Looks like so far that was a false breakdown. Uh, I guess we need to wait wait and see if we get a solid breakdown below that number. I do think we're eventually headed towards lower yields, but I definitely want to ask Mark Grant about this because I think he's going to have some fascinating thoughts on the bond market. Well, thanks for that market wrap, Eric. Now for this week's featured interview, Hilltop Investments Chief Strategist Mark Grant is joining us. Now Eric's interview with Mark Grant is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me next on the program is Mark Grant, Chief Strategist and Managing Director at Hilltop Securities. Mark, thanks so much for joining me on the program. I want to start by reminding our listeners that we taped this interview on Wednesday morning, so we don't yet know the outcome of the FOMC meeting. But just this morning, Wednesday morning, you published an article on Bloomberg describing why you don't think that this uh, announcement that everybody has been looking forward to, will she or won't she reduce the size of her balance sheet, you don't think it's a, is nearly as important as most people seem to. So Please give us a summary of what's in that article, which our listeners will find a link to in their Research Roundup email. Certainly. My comment is that the uh, Fed actions today mean much less than most market participants are taking it. And the reasons, there are a number of reasons for it. The first one is that the Fed, in terms of their assets under management, is now the fourth largest of the central banks in the world with the uh, uh, Bank of China, the uh, ECB, and then the Bank of Japan all being bigger in that order. And consequently, uh, while the people in the United States and the institutions in the United States tend to focus on what the Fed is doing almost uh, with laser-like quality, what the other central banks in the world are doing is every bit as important, if not more important. The world is now global and all three of them are continuing to print money at about $300 billion a month. And if the Fed cuts back today, it'll be minuscule by comparison. So it'll only mean a little less money is globally available in the world to be invested. We do have a link to the rest of that article in the Research Roundup email. Let's move on to the U.S. dollar. You know, we've had so many guests on this program. We're all dollar bulls until recently, and of course now the, there's been a fairly abrupt change. Do you think we're nearing a bottom here and this dollar rally is set to resume, or do you think we're actually seeing a secular change of direction for the U.S. dollar? I think we're seeing a uh, secular change of uh, direction. Uh, I think a lot of it is caused by... Uh, what Europe and the Bank of China have uh, done in terms of their own uh, portfolios. It's had a material effect on the dollar. I think the line in the sand, if you will, is 120, which I've said for about the last uh, six months versus the euro. And if we break that support resistance line, we're currently at 1.1987 this morning as we're talking. I think that's going to have a material impact on U.S. corporations, both positive and negative, and especially the global corporations in terms of exporting our goods and then, of course, in terms of our cost of importing uh, goods from Europe and from Asia. 
And let's talk about the U.S. equity market outlook with that view on the dollar. So many people are calling tops here saying it's just so overvalued and has to go down, but the market keeps on marching higher. What's your outlook for the U.S. equity market? I think the driver is not P.E. multiples or earnings or the normal things uh, that 10 years ago or more we would have looked at to be the causation of the uh, Uh, S&P 500 or the Dow Jones. I think the driver of the equity market and the debt market, by the way, is one thing and one thing only at this point, and that's the uh, over $19 trillion created by the central banks. And that money keeps uh, equity prices high, keeps bond yields low, and causes a compression of risk assets, both equity and debt, versus our sovereign debt or treasuries. I think that single factor is the driver for all the markets at present. Now, when you say that is the single driver, does the fact that the Fed is talking now about beginning quantitative tightening cause you to think that that factor is going to stop having the effect it's been having? Or would you say that the quantitative tightening they're talking about is small enough that it's not really going to make very much difference? Uh, I would totally be in the camp of your second point that the amount that they're talking about is so small compared to the amount of money that's manufactured every month by the other central banks, that realistically it's going to make very little difference. I'm in the camp that until the global central banks stop printing, that equities are going to head higher, bond yields are generally going to head lower, and corporate bonds, mortgages, and all of the the risk assets are going to continue to tighten versus treasuries. And with respect to the Treasury outlook, you know, we've had this debate as to Jeff Gunluck famously called the one spot 35 or whatever the number was on the 10 year as, you know, that's it. It's all uh, uphill and yields from here. Other people have been as bold as Raul Paul say, calling for 50 basis points on the 10 year before this is over. Do you think the 35 year bond bull market really is over like Jeff Gunluck thinks, or do we still have lower to go in yields? I think we have lower to go in yields. I know that Jeff called for 3% by this time on the 10-year, and (laughs) not such a great call. I projected 2% in the short term. The lines in the sand, if you will, are a resistance level on the 10-year to 232 on the upside and 2.16% on the downside. We're right in the middle of that range right now. And I think after uh, the Fed comes out today, unless it's a huge surprise, bond prices are going to go higher, yields lower once again. I had Hugh Hendry on the program last week, Mark, and he surprised me by saying he sees inflation coming in a big way. And, uh, of course, we haven't seen inflation in the economy for a long time. With the beginning of quantitative tightening, it seems like that's even harder to believe. Do you see inflation as a risk anytime soon in the economy? No, I do not. I think inflation is very subdued. And I think in the upcoming uh, weeks and quarters, because of the uh, tremendous cost, Moody Analytics uh, estimates the cost of the two uh, hurricanes, Harvey and Irma, at about $150 billion. And uh, then we have, of course, Maria swinging our way. And I think that's going to be a big factor in continuing to control inflation. And of course, uh, we saw that to some extent today in terms of home sales and that weren't nearly what uh, people had thought. And I think a lot of that reason had to do with the two hurricanes. And do you have, I know that you are down there in Florida in the thick of this, do you have a view as to how the hurricanes are going to affect markets in in the sense of, you know, is this uh, going to be the so-called broken window theory that there's going to be economic stimulus because of all the rebuilding that's going to have to occur down there in Florida? Or do you think that this ultimately has a potential downside risk factor for financial markets? Well, the downside risk factor is the first factor before we get to the rebuilding and that, of course, is the tremendous amount of property damage. Also, it's going to have a big effect, I think, on the uh, mortgage markets, as a lot of people will uh, not be able to afford their mortgage, or just frankly, uh, they won't pay their mortgage if their house was demolished, such as about half of the houses in the Florida Keys. So I'm looking for the first impact financially to be a negative one, And then in terms of the rebuilding, you have to look at the tremendous cost to the federal government, but also to the states, to uh, 
state of Texas and the state of Florida and to with the local municipalities that are going to probably have to borrow more money in the marketplace to uh, begin the rebuilding process, which is one of the reasons that I think that uh, the Fed's timing would be very ill-chosen to raise interest rates at this point. If we see people walking away from their mortgages in mass because the destruction that occurred basically left them uh, you know, underwater, pardon the pun, uh, in terms of the equity <laughs> in their properties, uh, who takes the hit on that? I mean, obviously, most of this debt is securitized, so it's, it's not bank stocks directly. Who, who holds all of that paper? And is there a concentration in Florida as to how that's distributed in particular bond holdings? Or is it really just mortgage-backed securities in general that would take the hit from this? Well, it would be the uh, banks in the first issue, though a very large amount of the uh, mortgages, as you point out, have been securitized. They're held by Fannie Mae and uh, Freddie Mac, and we could see a uh, material hit to their balance sheets if that takes place. And, of course, also in the case of the two housing agencies, those two agencies, there have been a lot of talk about privatization recently. And I think there's some uh, risk there in owning those two federal agencies far uh, greater than owning uh, some of the other federal agencies. Mark, let's move on to precious metals, a topic that is near and dear to many of our listeners' hearts. Obviously, with the dollar, as you see it, taking a secular change of direction, that should be good for gold, I would think. Is your outlook favorable for gold and silver? And how do you see the market evolving from here? My outlook generally is uh, favorable but not overly favorable. And the reason for that is that gold is driven usually by two factors, one, some sort of calamity, and two, inflation. So since my outlook is for a very low inflation rate, I don't think that's going to be driving gold. Two of the things that could drive gold are political events, uh, the two most dangerous of which, if you will, are uh, what's happening with North Korea and then what's happening in Venezuela. And those two events, if something actually hits the wall or unravels, could certainly drive gold to a higher price. So I'm slightly positive on gold, but I'm certainly not in any rush to go out and uh, suggest that people or institutions buy it. Let's move on to Europe. We've seen so much uh, happening there, and a lot of people see the election of Macron as maybe a turning point for Europe. And, of course, we're seeing the euro strengthening against the dollar suddenly. Do you think we are at a turning point? And in terms of things like European exit contagion risk, do you think that's contained now, or do you think that there's still more turbulence coming for Europe? I think the uh, Macron's Election in France was net positive. He's a businessman. He understands uh, not only uh, governmental affairs, but he understands how the capital markets work. I think that's always a positive to have a prime minister or president in that position. He also seemed to uh, strengthen somewhat his ties with Germany, uh, which I think is probably a positive. The uh, negative in Europe right now is in their corporate bond sector. What they did with the Italian banks, which was instead of using the European stability mechanism to deal with the bad loans and the bankruptcies in uh, Italy and also in uh, Banco Popular in uh, Spain, my opinion was a travesty. They said basically that any bonds that were sold to local investors were missold, which means that they paid, they're going to pay them back 100% on the dollar while the actual institutional bondholders that own the subordinated debt, both in America and in Europe and in Asia, are going to have to take quite a haircut, a huge haircut. And so there's no question that the institutions that I speak with are very upset about what took place in the European corporate bond market, and they've cut back their position substantially in a number of cases And I expect that to continue. I would also make the comment that if Europe can do this for their bank debt, they can certainly do it for other debt. And if they do it for subordinated debt, they can do it for senior debt. So now we know that the indentures for European bonds have very little value because they can change them at the uh, whim of their political process. And uh, I've had any number of discussions with uh, some major institutions in the United States, Europe, and Asia about that subject. And uh, I think American debt 
is a much safer proposition uh, for uh, bondholders, whether they're institutions or people. Let's move on to Asia. Kyle Bass was, uh, has been very outspoken for several years now, and just last week kind of renewed his assertion that he thinks the massive credit expansion in China has to come to a very bad end. He, uh, I think, just last week went on record saying he thinks it has to happen sometime within the next year. And so he's calling for potentially a major devaluation of the yuan, which he thinks will be necessary for China to be able to recap their banking system after a credit calamity. Uh, do you think there's any any credibility in that argument? Certainly, Kyle has been saying this for a few years, and it hasn't happened yet. Do you agree with him that it's coming, and how would you see it occurring? I've read Kyle's comments before. They're certainly well-reasoned, with the exception that I think he's left out a few issues out of his uh, thinking process. One is, of all the central banks in the world currently, the uh, PBOC or the People's Bank of uh, China is the largest in terms of assets. They can keep increasing their assets because they can print money and raise it even further. That would be one comment I would make that Kyle hasn't thought about. And I think that's what's buoyed them to this point. Two, they certainly can adjust their currencies. Uh, Many of your listeners probably know the Chinese have a two-tiered system, an internal a valuation of their currency and an external valuation of their, cur- of their currency. So it's possible to devalue locally or to devalue internationally or to do both. And the offset, as I said, is the printing of more money to finance uh, the, their debt expansion. In normal circumstances, uh, and given a, a country that wasn't so controlled politically, I would agree with Kyle's assertions. However, given that it's China and the way they operate, uh, they could still go on several more years operating just the way they are now, either by the currency adjustment, as Kyle says, but they could also just keep adding to their uh, printing presses, printing more money, and even expanding the uh, balance sheet of the central bank further. Mark, I want to go back to your earlier point, which was about what's driving these markets in general. Could you elaborate for us a little bit more? It sounds like you really think that this central bank-supplied liquidity is the key to everything. Is that right? That's correct. I'm reminded of uh, the movie All the President's Men, where they said, follow the money. And uh, I think that statement is accurate, uh, not only in the context of uh, that movie, but context of our current markets. You know, until the Lehman disaster uh, and the financial debacle that followed, the uh, markets were uh, largely driven by P.E. multiples, earnings, to some extent, and to a great extent now, stock buybacks. And I just don't think that's true anymore, and I don't think many large investors have adjusted to the fact that it's the money that's driving these markets. This tremendous creation of money at the central banks, as I said, now over $19 trillion, according to Yardini Research. You, you basically created an economy or a country, if you will, with no name that has as much uh, GDP or has an economy as large as either the United States or China. And by this time uh, next year, they're printing about uh, still globally about $300 billion a month. We're going to have an economy that's bigger than any country in the world that's been created by 50 or so people at the uh, central banks of the world. And we've never had in the history of uh, the financial markets a situation like this. So in my opinion, it's not a question of uh, new normal or old normal, to quote my friend Bill Gross, but it's a question of absolutely no normal because we're in an economic situation, a financial situation created by the central banks that has never occurred before. And I think the flow of money is what's driving the markets.
A lot of people have asserted the viewpoint that corporate buybacks that, of course, are enabled by these very low interest rates that central bankers have given us are the real driving factor here. Would you agree with that view? And it seems like they're slowing down at least a little bit, although I think if we continue to see lower interest rates, you know, you would probably expect that to continue as long as there's a junk bond market to fund these these buybacks. Do you think that plays a really big role and do you see it continuing? I think it plays a role, but not a really big role. And as a matter of fact, if you look at my general overall thesis, it's the fact that interest rates are where they are that is allowing these uh, buybacks because it makes sense economically. I would also point out that the United States, of all the major countries in the world now, has the highest interest rates, which makes no economic sense given our size, the depth of our markets, and uh, the earnings of our economy, and yet the ECB has driven uh, interest rates for various countries in Europe substantially below ours. So even in some countries, if you look a few years out at the uh, two-year, you'll see that Germany and France and the Netherlands and a number of countries actually have negative yields. And uh, here we are with our own two-year to 1.39, while, um, for instance, Germany is minus minus 0.70. So the world's bond markets are totally driven by what the central banks have done, and the fundamentals that used to apply in terms of a country's uh, economic position have very little to do with where interest rates globally are at this point. Is there a limit to how negative negative rates can go? You know, a lot of people have suggested if they go too far, it creates a cash hoarding incentive and and potentially a run on the fractional reserve banking system as people start hoarding cash in order to get zero interest rates instead of having to pay a negative interest rate. Um, Does this have a limit? And how far do you think central banks are willing to push this? You know, since this is such a grand experiment, it's very difficult to know what any kind of limit is. If you look, for instance, at Switzerland, their two years m- minus 0.94%. Could it be minus 1.94%? Absolutely. You know, the, the issue sometimes becomes in a situation like this, and I've given a, a lot of thought, is you can't invest off-world. So you're stuck now in this global environment of, you know, the United States buying mortgages and agencies and treasuries at our central bank, but in the case of Switzerland, in the case of Japan, Japan, the central bank of Japan now owns about 70% of the equity market in Japan, and they buy ETFs as well. And Switzerland is also buying uh, equities along with debt. And there's been a talk of some slowdown, which we're going to see in a few hours at the Fed, and the ECB has made a noise or two about it, but so far, uh, nothing. And it also means, of course, that you're paying a bank, say, if you're at negative interest rates, you're paying the bank to hold your money. So we have something that if five years ago I would have said out loud, everybody would have said that, you know, I'd lost my mind. And yet here we are in this very uh, new situation where uh, we have negative interest rates, which nobody ever thought could happen, and they've happened. Now, uh, the consequence of this that I see, and I'm surprised that it's not front-page news in in the mainstream press, is this situation of extremely low yields has, I think, basically paved our way to what I think has to be a pension crisis at some point. You see, the whole pension system, whether it be state-backed entities uh, that are underfunded or corporate pensions that are underfunded, everybody's underfunded. Nobody is able to achieve the yields that they need that their systems were designed for. And a lot of people have suggested that this could mean that, you know, and it's coming at the worst possible time, just as the baby boomers are entering retirement. Are we bound for a pension crisis? And if so, what's it going to look like? I think we're not bound for. I think we are already in a pension crisis. It's a, it's a very severe crisis, but this isn't something where you fall off the uh, bandwagon tomorrow because the municipalities and the states, of course, can increase taxes uh, to deal with it. The pension assumptions that they've used, somewhat over 
aren't even close to reality, and we are now beginning to see tremendous pressure on a number of states. So the worst states, so I can provide some information to users that might own municipal bonds, are New Jersey, then Kentucky, Illinois, Connecticut, Colorado, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, South Carolina, Rhode Island, Massachusetts. And the situation year over year is worse. All of those states are at negative numbers in comparison with last year, which means their pension liabilities are increasing. And we're going to start having some real problems because of this. I don't think it's a question of insolvency. I just think it's a question of the rating agencies, which did a terrible job during the uh, subprime mortgage mess, I think have done a lousy job with many of the municipal credits. And I think anyone that owns municipal bonds or is planning on buying municipal bonds has to take a very close look at what the pension obligations of any uh, state or municipal entity is to try to gauge the uh, future economic health of the underlying entity, which obviously will affect the bonds that they own. Let's carry this forward into how it might resolve, because I, I, I've been interested to see a lot of analysts have said, okay, so we're going to go a few more years, and then these systems are going to blow up, and the retirees are not going to get their benefits. It's just mathematically impossible that they're going to get the benefits. And I kind of think, well, okay, I, I believe that argument, but it's also socially impossible for them not to get their benefits, because, you know, it's a democracy, and if, if the largest... Uh, demographic component that we have is the baby boomers and you just tell them hey sorry we're going to break our promises to you you're not going to get your social security benefits that would cause a a, a massive political upheaval so it would put tremendous pressure on politicians to quote unquote do something what do they do do they just print more money at that point in order to satisfy all these obligations and how would you see it unfolding well as you know the states can't print money it's only the federal government it's only the, the the uh, Fed that can print money, but what they have to do then is turn around and raise taxes to begin to deal with it. There was a very thoughtful article out recently by John Malden who was uh, talking about that very issue. The uh, politicians, I mean, he, he used very strong language saying that they lied, but they've certainly overpromised what they can deliver in terms of the pensions, and then they used all these very high pension assumptions in terms of the return on the on their investments, and that allowed them a number of years where they didn't have to put in uh, nearly as much as they would have had they used more realistic uh, pension assumptions, and now they're in trouble. But I don't think it's a question of insolvency, meaning that they're going to fall over the cliff. What's going to happen is, and what we've seen happen, as a matter of fact, recently in California, is CalPERS, the uh, large uh, uh, state pension fund for the state of California, has gone to any number of cities, and it's been in the press, and they've cut back what they're going to pay the pensioners. Of course, this is going to cause all kinds of uh, social and political issues, but Calper said, we only have X amount of money, we only receiving X amount, and they've cut back the uh, pensions of a number of people in a number of cities in California, and I think that th this could uh, spread out uh, to these uh, other other states that are in trouble, and uh, it's going to be a big mess. Let's move on to geopolitical risks next. Obviously, you know, we've got sort of unprecedented events. North Korea is literally threatening to annihilate the United States with nuclear weapons and may have the capability to do so or at least take a serious crack at it. China, meanwhile, is threatening that if the U.S. were to initiate or take a preemptive strike against North Korea, that China would defend North Korea. So we've got a really big standoff. Uh, how do you see this both in terms of the geopolitical political risk, but also it, it's striking to me that it hasn't had hardly any effect on markets. I mean, you'd expect to see gold going to the moon and, and maybe the stock market at least taking a significant dip on this, and it's not happening. What's going on here? Well, what I think is going on is that rational people uh, have a very hard time believing that something like that could actually happen, and so they dismiss it. And uh, don't pay attention to it and don't invest because of it. I think it's just the nature of being a human being that you can't believe that something like that could happen. Uh, 
I think the situation, and I've uh, written about it, is uh, far more dire than most people think. I think uh, head of North Korea is not a very rational person. You've seen what how he's executed his relatives with howitzers and fed other people to dogs. I mean, you have to ask yourself what kind of guy this is. And could he make a mistake or could he push it too far? I think the answer is yes. I One of the commentaries that I wrote out of the box, which goes to, I write daily, which goes to about 5,000 institutions in 48 countries, I wrote that if some ninth level technician did not program the last missile correctly and it had landed on uh, Japan instead of flying over it, you'd see the 10-year Treasury at uh, 1.5% before you were able to blink your eyes. And I'm very concerned because I think this is a very dangerous and very irrational person, and he uh, reminds me to, in some extent of uh, a fellow uh, that caused World War II in Germany. So I think you can't dismiss it as that it can never happen. You have to consider in your mind that there is some possibility of it happening, even though all of us, any of us, hate to think of it. In the case of Venezuela, you have a virtually a socialist government that's become a dictatorship. They have uh, big holdings in the United States because of their oil company. Mr. Trump and company has said that uh, they're not going to allow any more uh, new financing in the United States. At some point here, uh, if it gets bad enough and they cut them off entirely, then you're going to see the court system probably seize their assets for various creditors. And you have not just a South American problem, but you have an American problem. And, of course, then the uh, price of oil could spike as a result of all this. However, having said that, one big change in all of our lifetimes, all of your listeners' lifetimes, is that the United States, because of our shale oil production, now has bigger reserves of oil than anybody in the world. And uh, we can, uh, if we so choose, could literally choke some of these countries that are sponsoring terrorism just by keeping the price of oil low while their social programs in uh, Saudi Arabia and Libya and uh, a number of uh, countries, including Russia, are 80 to $120 a, a barrel. So again, it's not insolvency tomorrow, but it's a grinding problem that's going to uh, cause, my opinion, material effects over a period of time. One of the things that happened in Venezuela was there was a threat that, you know, one of the things we could do for sanctions would be to take away their ability to transact in dollars. And Venezuela almost preemptively responded by repricing their oil in yuan. Meanwhile, uh, supposedly the Shanghai Futures Exchange is working on a yuan-backed oil contract. What do you think of this trend of de-dollarization of other nations trying to move away from the U.S. dollar to reduce their dependence on the United States and its currency. Do you think that, uh, and, and also I guess what impacts would you see it having on financial markets? I think that they're trying to do that. You can certainly price whatever commodity and whatever currency you wa want to, but you have several major problems with that. One is that most of the world's transactions are done by uh, using the SWIFT system, which is the American uh, system which uses the dollar in terms of uh, scoring up transactions. Two, well, China would like to do that, they have a corresponding problem in trying to do that, which is that then they lose control of their currency, both on an internal and external basis, which would cause them tremendous political problems. So I think there, people are trying to do this, various governments are trying to do it. I think the chances of any kind of real success are minimal. Let's move on to President Trump, and I think a lot of people have put a, a lot of uh, expectation around the market responding to the very many things that President Trump campaigned and promised to do. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems to me that President Trump is not exactly friends with a lot of people in Congress, and it's hard for me to see how he's going to accomplish these things. Do you agree with my view that maybe not all this stuff is going to happen? And if so, what does that mean in terms of any pricing that may already be built into markets, assuming it was going to happen. Certainly. So on November 8th and 9th, I said publicly uh, that uh, Mr. Trump was going to win the elections and to buy equities. And I thought 
that was the right call at the time. I think in hindsight, it was obviously the right call. The The issue here is complex because he, he certainly ran on the Republican ticket. We really only have two parties in the United States. And uh, he won on that ticket, but whether he's really, quote, unquote, a Republican is uh, questionable. So we have a man in the White House that, one, wasn't really a Republican, and two, is more of a businessman and and used to doing deals and he has his own view of things and i don't think he understood fully that the judicial system and that the uh, congress or the other uh, co-chairman he thought he was going to be the ceo and chairman and it doesn't work that way and i think he's learned that or maybe still learning that having said that Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, have had a huge pushback against what he's wanted to do, and I think that probably has as much to do with his viewpoints as with the way he's trying to do things. We have uh, Congress, of course, are chock full of insiders. They've been there for years, any number of them. They know how to play the game. They know how to do the negotiations, and... uh, I don't think Mr. Trump came to the office with that kind of information. One of the issues, I think, going forward for the markets is that a lot of President Trump's visions here in terms of getting rid of Obamacare, in terms of building a wall, in terms of uh, cutting back radically on uh, taxes are being uh, accepted very well in Congress. And while lately there seems to be a little bit of positive movement, I think that that's going to uh, cause a uh, agenda that uh, doesn't take place nearly as fast as many people thought in the uh, early days of his presidency. And finally, as we close, give us a quick overview of what you do at Hilltop Securities and let our listeners know where they can follow your work. I'm the chief strategist of uh, the firm. We're 5,500, 6,000 people. The firm is headquartered in uh, Dallas. We're a regional investment uh, banking firm, plus we also have uh, prime mortgage and prime lending, and we own a number of banks, and it's uh, six different parts uh, of the firm. Um, Out of the box uh, does not go uh, to the general public, though they can read uh, my comments uh, in Seeking Alpha. It's uh, published there almost every day. And uh, Bloomberg, because I'm a Bloomberg prophet, they publish... uh, my articles every Wednesday so they can find uh, what I'm saying on Bloomberg on Wednesdays. But Seeking Alpha is the best place to uh, get it. And then I deal uh, directly with uh, some of the largest institutions in the world, trying to give them some outside advice and helping them in uh, executing their plans, having to do with asset allocation and even as specific as certain uh, certain equities or certain uh, bonds. So my day is... Uh, rather full of that. Uh, Hilltop is uh, listed on the New York Stock Exchange. It's HTH is the symbol. And uh, we're a rapidly growing uh, company that's uh, competing uh, in the United States with uh, all the uh, other uh, lead banks and regional banks. And our listeners can find a link to your latest article from this Wednesday on Bloomberg in the Research Roundup email that accompanies this episode of the podcast. We're going to have to leave it there in the interest of time, Mark. Thanks so much for another fantastic interview. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at macrovoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Now, joining us for this week's post game is former hedge fund manager, Jesse Felder. Welcome aboard, Jesse. Thanks for having me back on. 
Now, guys, what a great interview with Mark Grant. You know, to me, it's amazing that you can really see in the macro analyst space that there's really two camps. There's the camp of uh, analysts that believe that inflation is about to surge higher and those that continue to think that inflation is going to be pressed. And it's interesting to hear all these different guests come on and make their cases and arguments for this. What stood out for you in that interview? Let's start with you, Eric. Well, Patrick, I think there are three things that are absolutely critical here, and you just touched on one of them. You know, the three questions in my mind that investors really need to figure out, the most important things that we need to figure out. Number one, is inflation a real risk, as Hugh Hendry very much thinks it is, as we discussed last week with Hugh, or is it not, as we just heard from Mark Grant? Number two, U.S. dollar rally. Is it the Raw Paul, Julian Brigden view that this is just a, a normal correction and we're about to see resumption of a secular bull market in the U.S. dollar, or is it the secular change of direction that we heard from Luke Groman and now echoed today by Mark Grant? So that's number two. Number three, I think, is this question of stock versus flow. And what I mean by that is the way that Ben Bernanke has told us that quantitative easing works is it's the creation of all this money. The fact that that liquidity is in the system and is displacing other actors that might have been competing to own the same treasuries. It's the fact that it exists. And that was certainly echoed by a few of our guests like Pippa Malmgren. On the other hand, there's this competing view that it's not the amount of liquidity, it's the flow in and out. So it was when new liquidity was being created that creates buying pressure. And when liquidity is being taken out of the system, as the Fed has now announced that they're going to do, that means that it is essentially the tide going back out, that that's creating selling pressure. And I think that was an analogy that one of our guests used on the program was, you know, the tide was coming in, now the tide's coming out. So which is it? Is it the stock argument or the flow argument? And it's pretty clear to me that there's merit to both of those arguments. I'm sure there's some truth to both of them. But which one is the the driving factor? Uh, I think we're going to find that out. I think if you can figure out those three key questions, uh, you've got a huge lead on this market. Frankly, they're all challenging to me. Uh, How about you, Jesse? What did you think of Mark? Mark Grant's uh, comments. Well, you know, I, I think the uh, the inflation discussion is a really important one. And there's one thing I I talked to uh, a couple of uh, individuals with very different backgrounds uh, recently. I had uh, William White on my podcast, who's you know head of the economics board at uh, the OECD, former chief economist of the BIS, and he kind of echoed something that Bill Fleckenstein told me a few months ago, which is. You know, the um, central banks can have the markets kind of under their thumb until the bond markets take the printing press away. And it was interesting for me to hear from two different guys looking for the same catalyst to the end of this uh, the central bank experimental monetary policy. And so the inflation discussion becomes, you know, maybe the most important one. And I did listen to Hugh on, the, on your show last week, and I think it's fascinating that he's, he's looking at this as a, a mid-60s type of uh, environment because you know right on the verge of inflation taking off again you know, William White brought up something to me that you know a lot of people are thinking about inflation in, in the wrong way and they're looking at demographics as potentially deflationary and he makes a point that demographics are actually just the opposite very inflationary like currently because we had the baby boom generation that came in and that's a huge new supply into the labor force which is a deflationary force on wages now that the baby boomers are leaving the workforce, that deflationary force is is being removed. And one that I would uh, kind of liken to that is also the trend towards outsourcing, which is also another massive deflationary force, which now, you know, it seems like a lot of companies have basically outsourced as much as they possibly can. And now we're talking about, you know, reshoring of labor. And uh, we have a, an administration that's talking about potential, you know, nationalistic type of uh, economic policies, all which could be a potential reversal in those in that deflationary outsourcing trend. And so the combination of those two things could potentially be very inflationary over time. And uh, it's interesting to me to hear Hugh say that he thinks that we're, we're very close to that time. 
Let's come back to the stock market because, you know, you and I could agree with each other until we're blue in the face that valuations up here are kind of crazy on the high side. But we also know that expensive things get more expensive. And if we look at how bull markets tend to end, usually there is a euphoria stage at the end where there's some kind of parabolic rise to a blow off top. And we haven't really seen the parabolic rise yet, although these valuations are crazy. Uh, I have heard a few comments from technicians about breadth you know, not being what it was. We had Mark Grant comment today that the FANG stocks have not made new highs, even as uh, the index is. I know you follow DeMarc indicators and a number of other technical signals. What are your signals telling you? Is there reason to think that this is actually coming to an end? Or are we maybe just looking at a continuation of more of the same? Well, you know, breadth is one of those things where you could look at a variety of different indicators and it'll tell you a variety of different things right now. But the most popular one is probably the advanced decline line, which keeps making new highs. And I wrote a piece very recently suggesting that the money that's flowing into indexes could be hiding very bad breadth under the surface. So the advanced decline line, number advancers versus decliners, when money's flowing into the index, it's flowing into all the 500 stocks in the S&P 500 or everything in the, in the Russell 2000. And so everything goes up based on, or up or down based on money flows to the degree that money's being indexed. And so much money is being indexed today that I think it potentially is uh, diminishing the value of the advanced decline line. Because when you look at other things like the percent of stocks above their 200-day moving average, I mean, 40 percent of the S&P 500 stocks today are below their 200-day moving average, even as the index makes new highs. That's a lot of stocks that are technically in downtrends or technically in bear markets, whatever you want to call it, while the index is making new highs. You have other measures like cumulative volume on the New York Stock Exchange uh, has had the biggest divergence with price of whatever you want to look at, S&P 500 or the New York Stock Exchange composite, the biggest divergence in over a decade meaning that as prices are going higher, cumulative volume is not making new highs. It's actually flat for the last 12 months. And so that tells me that there's not as much buying power pushing prices higher. And one other indicator that I look at is just the ratio of an equal weight index to the market cap weighted index. And that ratio tells you, is it all the stocks in the index pushing it higher? Is it just a select few? And whether you look at the Russell 1000 versus the Russell 2000 or the S&P 500 versus the S&P 500 equal weight, that ratio has just been plummeting this year. And so that tells me it's fewer and fewer stocks pushing the index higher. And that's a classic sign of the waning or an expiration of a, of a bull market. Lowry's has done a lot of research in that regard. And, and so that's a, kind of a classic indicator to me that I'm, I'm seeing you know, right now. These, these types of breadth divergences are the biggest in a long, long time. I know you mentioned in the feature interview that you did on this program that you follow the DeMarc indicators. Give us quickly just a a little bit of background for anybody who's not familiar with that as to what it is and what are those indicators telling you now about this market? So I, I mainly use the DeMarc sequential indicator. This is something that Tom developed years ago to determine um, likely points of exhaustion in all different types of markets. And so he, he discovered these a long time ago, and they became very popular with certain traders like Paul Tudor Jones and Steve Cohen have, have used his sequential for a long period of time to determine points of trend change. And so one of the ways I like to use it is use it, look at them across multiple time frames. You know, look at a daily, weekly, and a monthly. When those kinds of things line up, like for instance, for instance, at the 2009 bottom, we had buy signals on, on a DeMarc sequential indicator on the daily, weekly, and monthly chart. They all lined up. It was a beautiful buy signal right in March of 2009. And we're kind of seeing the opposite of that today. Actually, Tom was on Bloomberg recently saying that all of his time frames are kind of lining up across a variety of different indexes. And so that's the type of thing that you look for for major trend changes. And I think that's what we're seeing today. He said all of them are lining up with a sell signal that's active at this time or lining up in some other regard. No, absolutely right. The DeMarc sequential sell signals are triggering on multiple time frames across multiple indexes. And just to put a point on, on top of that, too, you know, usually I look at daily, weekly, monthly, but there's a quarterly sell signal going to be triggered on the S&P 500 on October 1st also, which is very, very long term time frame that also lines up with these other shorter term indicators.
Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's this debate about stock and flow, and it seemed, at least in this interview, Mark Grant feels like, look, you've created all of this money. There's so much of it. The fact that you're starting to quantitatively tighten by removing some of that liquidity from the system, he thought was almost irrelevant because it's small. Other people would say, wait a minute, you know, tightening is tightening. If, if you're taking liquidity out of the system, that's creating more downward pressure. First of all, did you agree in general with his view that that it is central bank liquidity that's driving all of this. And if so, how do you see the stock versus flow thing? Which one do you think is more true or more operative in the market? It's kind of a, a chicken or egg thing question, I, I think. You know, I, I look at it as this whole thing with central banks is a great confidence game. So long as market participants believe the central banks are in charge and holding up the markets, then that will be reality. But as soon as market participants lose confidence in the central banks, which happens every time. (laughs) The central banks lose their power to prop up the markets, and that's a common theme throughout market history. So I do think right now the Fed tapering is, you know, if quantitative easing was bullish for markets, quantitative tightening has to be the opposite. But I'm really more focused on the European Central Bank and, and the Bank of Japan because I think rates over there have been pushed so low that that's why we've seen for the last few years you know, dollar assets in such high demand is it's investors just kind of fleeing to where there's real returns. And so, you know, when you see corporate bonds in Europe yields, you know, lower than than treasuries, that's going to create a dynamic of money flowing to the United States and into our asset markets. And, And that's what we've seen. So I'm more concerned with if we start seeing tapering in Europe, or uh, a rise in inflation there that forces uh, central banks to start reining back their policies there. I mean, frankly, the European Central Bank seems like they could be running out of things to buy pretty soon, which would be, which is going to be an interesting point. So, yes, I do think quantitative tightening is net net bearish, but because it's only 10 billion right now a month, uh, it's probably not the end of the world. Now, with all of these sell indicators lining up across the board, I know from several things that you've written months and months ago that you and I are in agreement that for people that maybe have been along this market since 2009, you know, hey, guys, it's a pretty good time to be raising cash, take your profits and and maybe uh, weather out what could be a storm here. Are you at the point now where you think it's actually time to go short this market or are you just in take the profits off the table mode? I'm pretty much long short all the time. So I have things that I own, although they're much more difficult to find these days, and they're much more obscure things that are not included in indexes and so get kind of uh, left behind. But yes, I do look at uh, a few things. Technically, right now, I'm looking at you know something like Apple, which looks ex- very expensive relative to its own history and potentially facing a disappointing couple of quarters with the new products coming out. And you know that is probably the most important stock to the market. Uh, semiconductors are going to trade off of how the, you know, well the iPhone sells. And for me, I'm also looking at the credit cycle. And a lot of these things point to me telling me that it is time to start focusing on the short side or at least be prepared to take advantage of it. We look at auto sales and we look at you know uh, uh, credit card defaults rising across the board. I mean, and the Fed tightening into this. Ray Dalio has brought up the 1937 scenario many times recently, but also for the past couple of years. And I think that's that's something to keep in mind, too. You know, Fed, Fed tightening, when the average American is not doing so hot and we're seeing rising defaults in auto and credit card loans, it's potentially problematic. And so I, I think, yes, it's going to be an opportunity to play the short side uh, very soon. Well, Jesse, I cannot thank you enough for joining us in our postgame segment on today's show. I really appreciate your insights. Now, I'm sure most of our listeners already know this, but you have your own blog as well as an excellent podcast of your own. Both of those are available at thefelderreport.com. Again, that's thefelderreport.com. We're going to have to leave it there in the interest of time. Folks, we need your help promoting the show, so please retweet us, forward your research, round up emails to your friends and colleagues, tell people about Macro Voices. If you can, we sure do appreciate the donations that we've been receiving. There's a donate button on our homepage at macrovoices.com. And most importantly, please register your free account at macrovoices.com. The more registered users we have, the more able Patrick is to recruit the very best feature interview guests. The benefit to you is you'll receive our free research roundup email, which never contains any advertising or marketing. It's just a compendium of links to all of the coolest free stuff that we could find on the internet every single week. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's research roundup. 
Now, you'll find in this week's research roundup the transcript with the interview from Mark Grant. You'll also find the link for Mark Grant's article that you referenced during the interview titled, There's Too Much Attention to the Fed. There's also a great article written by Ambrose Evans Pritchard about Canada flagged as hidden $14 trillion credit bubble strokes global crisis fears. It's a very Jeffrey Snyder feel as it is asking if inflation emerges forcing the Fed to tighten, will it drain worldwide liquidity and potentially surging the U.S. dollar? So it's a really interesting argument made by Ambrose Evans Pritchard about that a more of a U.S. dollar bull suck uh, type scenario emerging. There's also an interesting article from Kevin Muir titled The Fall Guy, discussing the idea uh, of fading that US dollar bear trade. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. So that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners, and we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share their content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter and we'll include it in our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at Macro Voices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to MacroVoices on iTunes to have MacroVoices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.